All right, folks, how are we doing? We will be at the bottom of page 45 in the student book. Um, and in the uh, scripture packet, it'll be page 20. Katie, will you close the door for us? Thank you. I will do a very quick review um, before finishing off lesson five. And then uh, there'll be a couple of different things we'll cover at the end of this lesson as well. Okay? So hope you're having a great week. Glad you're back. Let me pray and then we're going to jump into this. Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for his perfect life, his perfect death, and his perfect resurrection. Lord, that by his sinless sacrifice upon the cross, Lord, that he has rescued his people, he has rescued sinners, Lord, and we praise you for that. For Lord, we know that we fall short. We know that we have fallen short of your glory, that we are sinners. And Lord, the only way that we can approach you is because of the salvation that you have gifted us in your son, Jesus. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, you have opened our eyes. You have given us ears that hear the gospel. You've given us new hearts that have embraced your mercy and your grace, your salvation. And we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that you've given us the time and place to look at, to study, to read about the history of your church, how you have moved throughout the centuries to save individuals, to bring them into churches, to raise up leaders, to raise up defenders of your word, defenders of the truth. And we thank you, Lord, that you've blessed us with the resources that are just available to us with such ease that we can read about it, that we can read how and study and understand truly how magnificent and powerful you are, how you have orchestrated history to accomplish exactly what you say and said would happen. So Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we take time, Lord, to truly pray for the peace for Jerusalem. Lord, as your chosen nation, Israel, that it is being attacked not only by terrorists, by surrounding countries and nations and governments that hate them. Lord, that the world is coming against the Jewish people. We know that your promises are not empty. We know your promises are not temporary. We know that according to the Old Testament and New Testament, upon which you are the author, you have raised up the nation of Israel. You have not forever forsaken them. Lord, we know that you are bringing those sinners to Jesus, the Messiah. But we also know, Lord, that there is prophecy. There is promises that will be fulfilled amongst the Jewish people. And Lord, we know that you are the author of peace. But Lord, we know that you are also wrathful against sin. So Lord, we truly pray pray as those that were friends and allies of Abraham. Lord, we pray that you would bless the Jews. Lord, that you would bring salvation to them, but that you would rescue them as they go through this horrible onslaught, these satanic attacks coming against them. So Lord, truly we love you. We know our hearts, our futures, our destinies are in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, lesson five. Quick review, quick review here, the history of the church. We've come to this juncture, as you know, the first 200 years of the fact that God moved and he's, he's moving amongst the Gentiles, he's moving amongst the Jews, and he's, he's saving individuals, he's grouping them into churches, and really the Roman Empire is being turned upside down by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the more and more the church becomes dominated by the Gentile world, there's almost as if there's this, this um, overshadowing or even forgetfulness of 
the Jewishness that we read about in the New Testament. And so here in Lesson 5, we look at this unfortunate marriage between the Gentile world, that reigning Roman world, that Roman Empire, and they, although persecution does pretty much get squelched against the church, there are some unfortunate consequences of Rome embracing, at least in lip service, to Christianity. And we talked about this, how in the early 300s, how there's an explosion of false conversions, because to be Roman... To be friendly to the emperor is now to be a Christian. And so people are just giving lip service to being Christian and for political advantages. Uh, the church is moving away from its uh, correct leadership structure, uh, going to this bishop and archbishop of cities structure, again tied to the politicalness of the time. Um, they start marrying some pagan holidays and, and, and pagan calendar events with uh, some, and giving some, some Christianese, if you will, some Christian titles. We see missionary work has been decreasing throughout uh, the early 300s, okay? And there's this constant battle between false prophets and false teachers and those that are trying to teach biblical truth, all right? And so for the rest of Lesson 5, oh, by the way, we talked about Athanasius and this defense of the deity of Christ, that there were those that were saying that, uh, well, Jesus is uh, of Nazareth, and he's a real person, but he is a created thing. And he may be God, but he's a created God, and all these other uh, false teachings that were going on. And so God would raise up these leaders inside the church like Athanasius to defend the, the scriptural teaching. Okay, And it brings us here at the end of Lesson 5... Um, this council that is brought together, this council of Nicaea, where we have defenders of biblical truth going against uh, false prophets, false teachers, really cult leaders um, that are coming in and they're having to, if you will, defend the deity of Christ. Okay, so in Roman numeral five there, it's called the council's conclusion. Okay. Creedal articulation. All that means is they write a creed. Okay. Now creeds are both good and biblical. In fact, there are a lot of creedal statements or creeds found in the New Testament. Okay. Uh, like the phrase, for instance, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is a creedal statement. It's, it's a very biblical statement. It's many verses in the Bible. But what you're saying is Lord and Savior or Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Lord, God, Master of creation, Master of my soul. Okay, He is my Savior, Jesus Christ, meaning Jesus, the Anointed One, the Messiah. That is a creedal statement. You are making a statement of belief, of doctrinal truth, and that's found throughout the New Testament. And here, as the church's teachings... The biblical teachings uh, of God's truth are being challenged. They start formalizing these creeds. Okay, Creeds are just short statements, even short passages, that although in and of themselves are not scripture, they're not inspired scripture, but they are telling the doctrinal truths found in the Bible. Does that make sense? Okay, So, council's conclusion. Here we go. The Council of Nicaea did not determine or establish. Those are those blanks there. The Council of Nicaea did not determine or establish the doctrine of Christ's deity. Just because they wrote these creedal statements, just because they are defending the fact that Jesus is God, it, they didn't invent it, okay? They, are, they didn't determine it or establish it. They are, right here, it says, it rather affirmed and defended the doctrine that had always been taught by the church going back to the time of the apostles and being established in the scriptures. Affirmed and defended. No new doctrine, no new teaching was invented or established. They were simply affirming and defending what the true church of Christ had always taught, okay? Now, out of this council 
comes what is called the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed. All right? If you will, maybe to put it in our own vernacular, this is the council's um, statement of beliefs. Okay? Statement of beliefs. So this Nicene Creed. I'll read it here. There's a lot of good stuff in here. It says, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of his Father, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both which are in, in heaven and in earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered, and the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. And he shall come again to judge both the living and the dead. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. All right. So that Nicene Creed. Okay. Now, none of those parts, none of those sentences are direct verses of the Bible. You see that? Okay. But all of those sentences teach true biblical teaching. Okay? That's what a creedal statement is. And they would use this statement to basically say this this is the doctrine, this is the truth that should be taught in your local church. If your local church, your elders, or they had to deal with bishops and archbishops, if they are not teaching this, if they are teaching things that are going against this statement, they are heretical. Do not listen to them. Run away from them. Okay, That's the purpose of this creedal statement. Bring this into our world. Okay, uh, For instance, this is a Southern Baptist church. You technically, by being a member here, all right, are a church member of a creedal church. Okay? We stand with what is called the Baptist Faith and Message okay, of the Southern Baptist Convention. Okay? Meaning, our creedal statement, what our doctrine that we are to teach in all of our sermons... And all of our lessons cannot go against the creedal statement of the Baptist faith and message. Does that make sense? Okay. If we do, or if I do, or one of the elders says something that goes against the scriptures and goes against this Baptist faith and message, uh, Jesus is a created being and is one way to be saved. If that was said in a class or in a sermon, you know... That would be incorrect. That would be wrong, heretical, not only according to scriptures, but according to the official teaching and doctrine creed of our church. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, although this thing is 1,700 years old, we are still copying what they are doing back there in the early church. Okay. All right. So that is the Nicene Creed. Now in your little notes section here, you don't have to write this word for word, but write this down. There's also another famous creed of this era, and it's called the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed. It wasn't written by the Apostles. It's called the Apostles' Creed because it reflects the doctrine taught by the original Apostles. Okay, very early on. Um, we have written documents of this as early as 200 A.D. Most scholars think that this probably was written even 100 years before that. So even in the time of John the Apostle, before he dies, this creedal statement that I'm about to read to you was probably being memorized and said inside the early church. Okay, It's called the Apostles' Creed. It says this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Sheol. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Church. I believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay, so that's another creedal statement that's being taught, it's being memorized, it's being put out there in the church to combat false teaching. Okay? All right. So if you find yourself, right, 2023, in our church or in another Baptist church or another just evangelical church, right, and they say that they are a creedal church, that's not, just because it sounds weird does not mean that it's bad or why I'm not a part of a creed. I believe in the scriptures only. Okay? But as Baptists, as evangelicals, we have followed the church's history pattern of using creeds. Okay? All right, question. Do most scholars uh, consider the Apostles' Creed and Artemis or Nehemiah as being the Anonymous. Anonymous, yeah. They, they, the earliest records, uh, they have multiple copies of this thing going to 200, 300 AD, but no author attached to it. Um, at that time, everything is shifting to Latin. There are Greek examples of it, but it's mostly done all in Latin. In Latin, yeah. They do. Uh, mm, some Catholic uh, groups still recognize the Nicene Creed and even the Apostles' Creed. Now, they've adjusted it a little bit, but they still say that they would be a part of the Nicene Creed. Now, we have, again, we have to be careful about this. Creeds are good as long as they are agreeing with Scripture. But even creeds and creedal statements can be used by Satan in a way to cause confusion. For instance, the RLDS church, the Mormon church, says they believe everything in the apostles and the Nicene Creed. So therefore, we are just like you in our teachings of Christianity. Well, they might be just like us according to those taught in those creeds, but they continue to do what? They add other stuff, okay, to it. So it can be used, and this, this came about about, oh, 12, 13 years ago. There was a group of scholars from the RLDS church that wanted to come together with scholars from some of the seminaries of Southern Baptist churches and come together and say, you are a creedal group. You believe in these creeds. You have your own creed, the Baptist faith and message. We have a creed as well. So let's see where we agree. And if we can agree enough, then let's just say that we are of the same belief. No, we're not going to do that. Okay, but it has happened from time to time, even in our modern times. Uh, who? Oh, yes. So you have the Apostles' Creed, right? Yes, there were based on some of the debates and accusations from false teachers. The Nicene Creed is really an expansion of the Apostles' Creed. Especially when you read in there, um, the only begotten of his father, of the substance of the father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Because at this time, Arius and his followers were saying, Jesus may be God, but he is of a different substance and he is a created being. And so they wanted to expand upon this. Good catch. Yes. All right. So that's the Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed, all right? And by the way, you can make a little note here. This is going to become really important about these creeds and about these doctrinal statements because uh, roughly when we, when we reach the dark ages of the church, right? When we get into the six, seven, eight hundreds, all the way until about 1500, when the Word of God is not really available to the everyday person, the Word of God is basically captured by the local parish priest and by the Catholic Church, okay? Um, creedal statements 
confessions are used by the reformers, okay, to really establish biblical truth again in the 1500s, the Reformation, when we have a Martin Luther and a, and a John Calvin and a John Knox and all those reformers, okay, they would make these creedal statements as well. And again, they weren't inventing anything new. They were just going back to the original good guys, okay, as they defended truth, they copied the same thing. Okay? But we'll get into that later. All right? So that's the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed all around at this time of the early church. Okay? Um, number six there, it says, standing against the world. Though he was only a deacon at the time of the Council of Nicaea, Athanasius, remember he's the good guy, spent most of the fourth century fighting the false teachings of Arius. He became the bishop of Alexandria just a few years later later. All right, just a couple of notes on here. It says, discussion, Athanasius endured 17 years of exile because he refused to compromise on the truth that Jesus is God. Why did Athanasius see the doctrine of the deity of Christ as so important? What would you be willing to go into exile for? Okay, uh, write this down in this note sections. Okay, this, this was the thinking of a lot of these early church defenders, these apologists, these, these debaters, these theologians, they would say this, if Christ is not God, he is a liar. If Christ is not God, he is a liar. If Christ is is a liar, he is a sinner. If Christ is not God, he is a liar. If Christ is a liar, he is a sinner. If Christ is a sinner, his death cannot save. If Christ is not God, he is a liar. If Christ is a liar, he is a sinner. If Christ is a sinner, his death cannot save. If Christ cannot save, we are still in our sin. These were the statements that these men made in these councils and in these debates. It's not just a small thing to, or a small disagreement to deny that Jesus is God. Everything hinges in Christianity on the understanding that Christ is God. Okay? And so Athanasius defended this as others defended it and they were willing to pay for it with their lives or at least even to be exiled for decades. All right? At the end of this chapter here, this legacy of Athanasius, this legacy of this godly man. A few lessons we can learn from the, na the man nicknamed the saint of stubbornness. Okay? But stubborn in a good way. We should be willing to contend earnestly for core Christian doctrines. A right understanding of the person of Christ is not peripheral, but central to the faith. Athanasius recognized the importance of that truth, and he was willing to sacrifice much to defend it. At times, being faithful means you will also be unpopular. That's, that is a given fact. Okay? It does not matter what century, what culture, what nation you live in. Being faithful means you will also be unpopular. Athanasius became the object of political attack and public scorn because he refused to compromise. His tenacity provides a compelling example for us to consider. Please know this, even in our own lives, that bubble of protection that Christians have lived in in this country is going away. 
It's going away. You are literally, you and I are literally living through it right now. Okay? The key to honoring God is to hold firmly and faithfully to what the Bible teaches. The pastors who signed the Nicene Creed did so because they saw the deity of Christ clearly taught in Scripture. That same Bible-based conviction fueled the dogged determination of Athanasius even in the face of great opposition. The examples of faithful men and women in generations past should motivate us to stand faithfully against the world in our own generation. Another way of saying that is, if the world hates you, you should not be surprised. That's the norm of the Christian world. The world tends to and has in the past hated us. Okay? Athanasius lived out the, his convictions with constancy and courage. His commitment to the truth did not waver. His example should motivate us to do the same in our own day. Biblical truth is constantly under attack. The question is, are we willing to stand for what we know is right and true? I encourage you, as you go through this, uh, this book, as we go through all these different lessons, as these names pop up, most of their biographies, very good biographies, can be found online and read for free. Okay, And if not, if you want to read, if you want to buy a book and own a book and not read it online, uh, you can come to any one of us pastors and, hey, I would really like to learn about this person. Or, you know, it really intriguing that, that they did this 1,700 years ago. And I'm telling you, it is very encouraging. Read the scriptures. Spend most of your time in the scriptures. But you need to spend time in good books. And the section of good books you should be reading are these biographies of these men and women throughout church history. It will be very encouraging, very encouraging, okay? So that is Athanasius, lesson five, okay? And we're still going to be in the three and four hundreds in this next lesson, but we kind of have to shift gears here a little bit on lesson six, okay? Questions on what we've covered? Yes, sir. Could you kind of explain what First John 4, 1 says then? Okay. You will... What part of it do you... First John uh, 4 and then verse 1. Okay. First John 4. Christ and those that don't believe that Christ is God. Some, could you explain that? Just yeah, let me read it out for everybody first. First John 4, verse 1. Is that what you're asking? Okay. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay? So, uh, do not believe every spirit. Okay. Why would John give that warning? Think of our day. Think of actually throughout Christian history. Why would John, the Apostle John, give that warning? What does Satan love to do? Attack God attack his bride, does he often do it like in some very easily seen, flamboyant way? Very subtle. Very subtle. In fact, he loves to disguise himself, wrap himself around even scriptural truth, and then just tweak it just a little bit. So he can make his way into a church. So what John is saying is do not believe every spirit. Just because you have somebody on, and I wouldn't even say inside the church because of technology. Just because you see something on TV, hear it on Bot Radio Network, or hear it on YouTube or something like that. And they call themselves a teacher of the scriptures or a, they even call themselves apostles now. Apostles and prophets of God. Should you automatically just believe them? I, nowadays, I would do the exact opposite. Okay? If they're using any language like that, I would pretty much just say, oh, okay, we're going to move away from that. Okay? So we're going to do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. How do you test these spirits or false prophets or false teachers? How do you test someone? For instance, let's say you didn't know me. How would you test me? Okay, I hear what he says. Is that what that says? Right? You run to the scriptures. 
Is, is that actually what the Bible says? Well, he's saying that God created Jesus? No, no, no. I read that somewhere in the New Testament. That's not true. So you run to the scriptures, okay? So that's how you test them. Because then it says, because many or few false prophets have gone out into the world. Many. This is also another technique Satan does. He doesn't just put all of his eggs in one basket. Satan will use false religions and cults and movements of different societies and cultures all at the same time to basically cause disunity, confusion, chaos amongst God's church. Okay, does that help? Um, in essence, yes. If you, if you are disagree with basic biblical truth, now know this, we've got to get into the whole fallen nature of man. If someone is denying that Christ is God, that Christ is the way of salvation, okay, if you are denying that, you by definition are a unbeliever, right? I'm, as an unbeliever, I am a sinner. In fact, I'm not just a sinner. I'm enslaved to sin. And the Bible also teaches as an unbeliever, I'm enslaved to who else? Mm -hmm. Satan himself. Not only that, I'm enslaved to him. And most of the time, I don't even know it. The Bible says that my eyes have been veiled. Okay? Now, we don't attack someone just because they say that right up front. We may mishear them. They may not know what they're saying. They may be confused. They may be quoting something that they read. We don't know. So it's good to have loving and patient conversations with them. But if there is consistent denial of these truths, then that person is an unbeliever. So then you don't, then you go back to having gospel conversations. You don't go back and try to defend the Old Testament, and defend the New Testament, and defend all this. You go back to the fact of, now when you say that Christ is not God, are you truly saying that the scriptures are untrue and that you believe Christ is something else? You have gospel conversations with them. Okay? All right? Yes? Um, the, the, the quick and dirty answer is this. The Ishmael and Isaac are still at war. As prophesied in Genesis. Okay? They will be at war with each other. Ishmael and Isaac. The chosen nation Israel, the Ishmaelites, the Arab countries. Okay? Now, there will be different politically and religions and all this other stuff. But in essence, the struggle starts right there because God prophesied it would be that way. Okay? That's the core biblical reason. The modern reason is God is moving amongst his people. We are living in the times of the Gentiles. This is the age of the church. Will this age continue forever? It will not. According to Daniel, according to Isaiah, according to Ezekiel, according to the Apostle John, this age will come to an end. When this age, the age of the church, comes to the end, God shifts focus from saving his people, his chosen from the Gentiles, back to what people group? Back to the Jews. As promised in Romans 10 and Romans 11. I really do feel, I'm not setting any dates, but I feel we are getting closer and closer and closer to the time where the entire world will come against the Jew... And they will call evil good, and they will call good evil. And just as Peter prophesied and John prophesied, when we get to that point, we are to look to the skies because our salvation, our harpazo, our rapture is at hand. We are coming to the end of the age. Is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is it next year? I don't know. You are not supposed to know. But we are a lot closer than what we were 10 years ago or 50 years ago or even 100 years ago.
okay? But in essence, that will continue. There will be no peace in Israel until it is brought in by the Messiah Jesus in his second coming. And that won't happen. Now I've got to plug my Daniel class and my Revelation class. So you go back online and study this. You got the age of the church. It ends at the harpazo, the rapture, right? Then there's a really horrible time upon the earth called what? Tribulation period, right? Taught in Daniel, taught in Matthew. Revelation gives all the details of it. We're in heaven receiving our crowns and our, our white linen clothes and the marriage supper of the Lamb. The seven-year tribulation is going on. The whole point of the tribulation period you have the rule of Antichrist. You have all the bold judgments and all that stuff you read about in Revelation. But ultimately, that is Daniel's 70th week. And it is promised to what group of people? Jews. To the Jews. And that is used, those seven years of tribulation, to drive the remnant, the elect of Israel, to belief in who? Jesus. Messiah Jesus. And they technically will usher in his second coming when they say... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they shall look upon whom they have pierced. That's actually the actual real second coming of Jesus. That is ushered in when the remnant of Israel believes in the Messiah. Okay? That's the down and dirty explanation of what's going on. If you want the biblical explanation, you need to read these passages. Psalm 83 Isaiah 17, Ezekiel 36 through 40, Ezekiel 36 through 40, Daniel chapter 7 through 12, and the book of Revelation. Okay? I am tempted, I've done Revelation three times, I've done Daniel once, I am tempted to do a prophecy class where I, instead of focusing on a book, I'll walk through the prophecies of Old Testament and New Testament, talking about the first coming of the Messiah and then what the second coming of the Messiah looks like. If you're interested in that, tell me, text me, email me, we might do that as well. But I also have written Ezekiel, so we could do that too. So, either way, either way. All right. Other questions on what we've covered? Mark, David, has this been going on for quite some time that uh, people are saying evil is good and good is evil? It has, but, it, it, but remember, as Jesus taught about the end times, it will be like a, a woman's birth pangs. They will become more intense, and they will be coming closer and closer together. So everything will increase in power and frequency the closer we get to the actual end of this age. So it's bad, then it's going to get worse, then it's going to get even worse. Okay? All right. Um, do what? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the, the reason the church cannot be present during the tribulation period is that the wrath of God is poured out upon the earth. Well, if you are of the bride of Christ, you are of the elect that has been brought inside the church, will God pour wrath out upon you? No. Nope, because he already did it. When does the wrath that you owe, okay, for your sins, when was that dealt with? On the cross. Okay? See what I'm saying? All right, so we can't be here for it. All right, lesson number six. You ready? All right. Augustine, Christosom, and the post-Nicene church. So we're going to get into the mid-300s to the mid-400s. Okay? Still a lot of good guys around, teaching biblical truth, standing up for biblical truth. But there's a more of an increase of false prophets. And they get sneakier and sneakier in this century we're about to study. Okay? John 1, 14-17, it says... And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was of he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. 
For of his fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. All right. Before we get into this, the, the name of this lesson is Grace and Truth. Okay. Truth is easy. Truth defined biblically is the revelation of God. Biblical truth. Biblical statements. Okay. God's word is truth. Okay. Grace is often misdefined. It's often given a wrong definition. Many times we use the word grace when we really mean mercy. Mercy, okay, mercy is where you are found guilty, but punishment is withheld. You are found guilty, but punishment is withheld. That's technically what mercy is. Grace is what is sovereign, unmerited favor. So biblical grace has its start not in man, but biblical grace has its start where? In God. It is sovereign, unmerited favor. Okay, so that is grace and truth. Keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this discussion of this uh, time of the church, okay? All right. To highlight the themes of grace and truth, we will consider the impact of two influential Christian leaders who lived in the late 4th and early 5th centuries. Right, the first guy we're going to study is Augustine or Augustine, depending on how you want to call it. Okay? Augustine or Augustine. He lives in this time, 354 to 430. There's this weird political marriage between Rome and the church still going on in its infancy. There's this background that, well, Christianity is true because the Roman Empire has declared it to be true. That's literally what society is thinking. The emperor, Rome, has declared Christianity to be true, therefore Christianity is true. What's the problem with that? Other than everything. (laughs) Rome is not the dictator of truth. Rome is not the dictator of what Christianity is or is not. The scriptures declare what is true. Christ has declared what is true. Christianity is true because it's true. And God has revealed it to be true. That salvation is found in Christ. Okay? But again, that's this backdrop going on. Okay? And that uh, Augustine is going to live in. All right? It's true because of the uh, testimony of Jesus, the testimony of the apostles, according to the scriptures. Okay? Christian salvation or Christian life, the rule of the Christian life, should be dictated by the word of God, not tradition. Now it's starting to get bad. This is the century where tradition really starts to take over. Okay? Okay? Um, So Christian salvation or the rule of Christian life is dictated by the word of God, not by tradition. And thus, in this backdrop, this Augustine shows up and he preaches and he teaches that the scriptures, the scriptures are the avenue to understand God Salvation, sin, forgiveness, life itself. He's emphasizing that scriptures are the way to understand this world, ourselves, to understand God, to understand salvation. Okay? So this Augustine, and you could put a little note there by his name. 
it is pretty much universally accepted that he is the greatest theologian of the Christian church for the first 1,500 years. His writings, his books, his sermons, his lessons have been studied throughout the centuries for 1,500 years. I studied them in seminary, right? Anyone that is an evangelical Christian that is doing serious study of the New Testament sooner or later will read the writings of Augustine. Okay? So Aurelius Augustine is one of the most influential theologians in church history. He was born in North Africa, not far from the Mediterranean coast, in modern-day Algeria. Okay? So he's just on the northern kind of tip of North Africa under the influence of the Roman Empire, obviously. His testimony vividly illustrates the power of God's saving grace. And I'll get into his testimony here in a minute. Romans 13 is kind of his life passage, his life verse, if you will. It says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. That is the verse that God uses to change this man's life, to rescue him out of his sin and to bring him into the light of Jesus. Okay, you got this little notes part here. We got a lot to cover. This man is extremely important. I want you to know about him, okay? Born in 354, North Africa, modern day Algeria. His father was an unbeliever. But his mother, Monica, was a strong Christian, an extremely strong Christian woman. In fact, Augustine, early in his life, he reflects upon his uh, beliefs of his mother. And he has this statement that he learned. He goes, our hearts are restless until they find rest in the Lord. Okay? Many feel that he was taught that by his mother. Our hearts are restless, our hearts are restless until they find rest in the Lord. And this, and this is going to play out in his life. Okay? Yes? How did his mother and father hear the word? Who did they hear it from in that area? In that area, you still have some very strong missionary work going on in North Africa. Okay? Now, remember, we studied in the early 300s that Rome and the church kind of come together in this unholy political marriage. Missionary work decreases, but it's still going strong in North Africa. And so there's gospel witness that she's a true believer at this point. Okay? All right? So our hearts are restless until they find rest in the Lord. This is something that he writes about in his influence with his mother. Age 16, he goes to Carthage. Okay? And he is studying rhetoric. Rhetoric. Uh, he's studying logic and the defense and debate and uh, speech, what we would call, how to defend one's thinking. It was known early on that he was brilliant. Okay. Based on his writings, his IQ is off the charts. He's a brilliant, gifted genius. But in his early life, he is a sinner. Okay, so he goes to Carthage. Age 16. At age 17, he starts a 15-year relationship with a woman that's older than him, and they never marry. It lasts for 15 years with this woman. Not a believer. He's not a believer at this point. She's not a believer. They do have a son together. And during this time, 
He joins a cult. Okay, Obviously, all of this breaking his mother's, Monica's heart. So he's living with this woman. They have a child together. In his 20s and his 30s, he joins a cult. Okay, uh, Hopefully I say this right. <laughs> it's hard. Manichaeism. I'm going to spell it. M-A-N-I. C-H-A-E. I-S-M. Manichaeism. It's a marriage between Christianity and Zoroastrianism. Okay? It's a weird Jewish cult that believed in mystics and uh, secret languages and all this other stuff. Okay? And it was, it was very philosophical and the, the earth and, and everything made of matter is evil, very much like Gnosticism. Okay? Very philosophical, very highbrow. This was a cult that a lot of wealthy people belonged to. Okay? And he's a part of it. So he's living with this woman. He's also pursuing drunkenness and even drug abuse. And then in 384, here's a big one. He goes to Milan, the city of Milan in Italy. And he hears, at that time, probably the best Bible preacher around. His name was Ambrose. A-M-B-R-O-S-E. Ambrose. Ambrose believed and practiced verse-by-verse verse teaching of the Bible. He wanted his hearers to understand the actual scriptures. It wasn't about tradition. It wasn't about being a good Roman citizen. Christianity was about Christ and to know about God and to know about salvation. You needed to know the scriptures. And so he was famous throughout the peninsula of Italy. He was famous throughout Rome. And this Ambrose is there teaching and he's preaching. And Augustine, on a whim, hears him. He goes and listens to him. Okay? I'm sorry? That's 384. So he's about 30. Okay? He's not convinced, though for the first time in his life, outside of his mother's influence, he's thinking about the scriptures, he's thinking about salvation in Christ. Okay? Then this is the famous uh, part of his salvation. So I'm just going to read it. So it says, one day while sitting outside under a tree, Augustine heard a child from a nearby house say, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. Augustine took this as if it came from God himself. So he went and found a Bible and opened it. And his eyes fell on the truth of Romans 13, 13 through 14. Remember what we just read? Okay. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness. Okay? Not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. Strike number two. Okay? Not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. It says, when he read the passage, it was as if God had removed the blinders from his eyes. He understood the gospel of Jesus Christ and believed in that moment. He then traveled to a city called Hippo, H-I-P-P-O. That's why most of the time you hear him, Augustine of Hippo. Okay? There, a man, we do not even know his name. An old preacher there, a pastor of this church in Hippo, 
disciples him. And he's so impressed with the leadership and the intellect and the understanding and the passion and drive of Augustine that they actually serve as co-elders, co-bishops of the church for 30 plus years together. And so he does most of his writing, most of his defending while they're in Hippo. Okay? So that's this background of Augustine. Okay? Almost like the story of Paul. Of all the people you would think that would not be the defender of Jesus and the gospel and Christianity, it's not going to be this dude. I mean, he's living in sexual sin and he's, he's part of a cult and all this other stuff. But that's the exact man that God raises up at this time to defend biblical truth. Okay, so um, discussion here. Augustine's conversion story is admittedly dramatic. The reality is that every testimony of God's grace is amazing. With that in mind, how would you explain the way God rescued you from sin and drew you to himself? So know this, whether you are of the great intellect like Augustine, part of a cult, or raised in a Christian household, it is still the same. Everyone is still miraculously saved from their sin by the power of the Holy Spirit through the preaching, reading, understanding of the gospel. doesn't matter if it's 400 A.D. or 2023. It is through the preaching, the teaching, the understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, We'll stop there, and then we're going to get into Augustine and Grace um, on page 50 next week. Okay? Huh? Yeah, it's two o'clock. Sorry. Um, let me pray, and then we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you again. We thank you for the salvation that we have in Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the grace that you have shown us. Thank you for the mercy you have given us. Lord, we thank you that we live in a time, though persecution is increasing, Lord, each one of us has such access to your word, the freedom to come and worship you. Help us, Lord, not to take that for granted. Help us, Lord, to be bold with the gospel of your son with those around us. Help us to be disciplined in our study and our reading of your word. Lord, give us the courage to share the truth with Jesus, with anybody who will listen. So, Lord, truly we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks.